In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Be seated. So to start off with, I have three stories of dinner parties or luncheons. Uh, the first one happened very early in my ministry as an ordained cleric. I was uh, very proud to uh, have been ordained, and, and I was very pleased to have been invited to a dinner at a church where I was going to be serving for a few months. And uh, my wife was my fiance at that point, and she was visiting in town and staying with some of the parishioners, and we were going to go to this, this dinner. So I showed up uh, at 5 o'clock, whatever time we'd been invited, uh, in my, my new Brooks Brothers suit that my mother had bought me for my ordination, and I was very much the, the young, strapping young cleric, you know. And uh, so I show up, and we have a kind of pleasant uh, dinner, I mean, sorry, a, a pleasant uh, kind of cocktail period, you know, where we're sort of enjoying ourselves. And uh, the first odd thing that happened was that um, the people that were with us would excuse themselves and go to the kitchen, and we could hear them talking about us, uh, you know, especially about Betsy, you know. Oh, she seems very nice. Oh, she's very pretty, and, you know, this kind of thing. And they didn't realize that we could, we could hear them perfectly well in the living room. Now, there were beautiful smells also coming from the kitchen. We could smell that there was a really nice roast in the oven, and it looked like there was something elaborate involving some kind of sauce and, and so on. So we were, we were quite excited about dinner. So then, uh, at a certain point, uh, as the evening went on, our host said to us, well, you know, Reverend, thank you for coming over. Um, we're going to have dinner now, uh, so we'll see you in church tomorrow morning. <laughs> now, I tell this story not because I want to be critical of these folks who had invited us and then disinvited us, uh, or to highlight the way in which we had misunderstood what this uh, event was going to be like, but because of my own pride that felt wounded in this moment. In truth, I had no reason to expect a meal. And even smelling those succulent uh, smells coming from the kitchen did not give me a right to expect anything in terms of hospitality. So I struggled with the fact that I felt my pride had been wounded. My pride had been wounded. But I had no right to feel that my pride had been wounded. And I didn't want this to get in the way of the good relationships I wanted to build with these folks either. But also, I didn't want to make a big deal out about it either. So that's one hospitality story. The next one is this. This didn't happen to me. This happened uh, in a book I read. Um, uh, this, this commentator was talking about scripture, and he's talking about one time he showed up for a dinner party, and uh, it, was, it was being hosted by some people that he didn't know, but a friend of his was going to be coming and had invited him, etc. So he went to this house and uh, knocked at the door, and they were very gracious to receive him, and they started having cocktails and cheese and, and, and lovely crackers and so on. And they're talking for a while, for about an hour or two, and it's just about time for sit down for dinner, and he's a little confused that his friend hasn't showed up. So he says to the, the host, I'm sorry, when is Bill getting here? I said, who's Bill? He had showed up at the wrong house. <laughs> and they were having a dinner party, and they were confused while he was there, but they were too polite to say anything. I think that story took place in the States, by the way, although a friend of mine says it probably should have taken place in Canada, but it's but, uh, another story. So the third story. Uh, it's actually from a movie. This is fiction. It's called The Lunch Date. It was a short film that won the Oscar for the best short film fiction in 1989. And the story is that it's all told in black and white. It takes place at Grand Central Station in New York. Uh, this woman, who's very well-to-do from the looks of her clothing, is walking past a bunch of homeless people, and as she goes into the, the, into the station, um, while she's going to her train, she bumps into someone, and, uh, and she misses her train. So, and she also, in the process, had her wallet pickpocketed. But she still has a little bit of money in her pocket, so she decides to have lunch while she waits for the next train. She goes to the restaurant, she uh, buys a salad, that's all she can afford with the little change that she has in her pocket, and she sits down and then realizes she forgot a fork. So she goes up and goes and gets a fork and then comes back. And she discovers a homeless man sitting at her booth, eating her salad. At first she's a little confused and she kind of glares at him and he doesn't really respond, so then she sits down across from him and so sort of looks at him some more, and he kind of shrugs. So she takes her fork, because she's really hungry, and starts digging into the salad. She starts eating the salad. And he's kind of nonplussed by this, and eventually he kind of pushes the salad to the middle of the table, and they eat together. And then he gets up and buys a coffee for her and puts it down in front of her. And there's no words exchanged in all this. Finally, they, they part. Uh, uh, well, I think uh, she gets up to get something, and then she comes back and she realizes there's another booth with an uneaten salad on it. She had sat down at the wrong booth <laughs> and ingratiated herself on this man. So here's the question. How much room do you have for the uninvited guest at your table? 
I know a wonderful family down south in Mobile, Alabama, actually Daphne, Alabama, who have a huge dinner table because they have lots of kids and their kids have lots of friends. And they never know how many people are going to show up. So often uh, the wife, she just puts on a big pot of water and then she adds pasta as the evening goes on and the friends start to show up. That's an example of tremendous hospitality. But the truth is, most of us, when we're confronted by this question, how much room do we have for the uninvited guest? Are we willing to invite the homeless person into our home and sit down with us, or, or the mentally ill person, or the ex-con? We probably kind of look down at our shoes and admit that we're maybe not as generous as we ought to be with our hospitality. Perhaps we do invite people that are like us and that we know are going to invite us in return. And so we feel a little shamed and that we haven't participated enough in the entertaining angels lottery, but we don't feel too badly about it. Maybe we make an extra donation to our favorite cause and we leave it at that. But I want to suggest that that is not a sufficiently uh, in-depth or spiritual response and that it, in fact, fails to take the gospel call seriously, that Jesus actually has some advice for us in these situations. So let's start by examining some of the problems in the common roadblocks. Uh, the first one is just the limitation of, of what if, what if. What if something really bad happens? What if they steal the silver? What if they hurt us? What if they come back later when we're not in the house? There's a TV show that I love called House of Cards. I don't know if you've even seen it. And it's a very brutal show. A lot of bad things happen. It's all sort of political intrigue and so on. But there was one moment of grace, I think, in the entire series that I, I want to latch on to. It was this, this woman who was um, trying to get out of a life of prostitution and and um, so she reached out to this uh, political chief of staff of a, of a senator and uh, asked him for money, which he refused to give her because she was trying to extort him. Um, but instead, he offered her a place to live. Uh, so he talked to the secretary in the office, and he convinced her to let this woman stay in the secretary's uh, guest room, which was formerly her daughter's room. And the moment of grace comes when this woman enters this room that belonged to this college-age girl, but it still had a lot of girlish things in it. There was her collection of toy horses, and there was a, a, a very girlish kind of uh, bedspread on the bed. And you see in her expression that she has never had a room like that, that she never had a childhood like that, protected and, and nurtured in the way that this young girl had been. So, but are we willing to go that far? Most of us, probably not. We could up the ante. Maybe it's not a prostitute. Maybe it's an ex-con. How many of us would be willing to have somebody that would be convicted of, say, a violent crime in our homes, even for a few moments? This kind of hospitality, let's tell the truth, is risky. It is risky. And most of us are probably not equipped to undertake it. It's also expensive. And I'm not talking about what it costs to buy an extra box of craft dinner. I'm talking about the emotional expense of allowing someone who has high needs into our lives. Maybe we're not talking about dinner or sharing our homes. Maybe we're talking about spending a few minutes talking to someone who has asked us for money on the street. Maybe we're talking about someone who we know in our lives who's run into some trouble or difficulty and wants to talk to us about it. It's expensive to be emotionally available to them. It's expensive to be that good Samaritan level of caring for the neighbor. The next limitation we run into, besides the limitations and expense emotionally and otherwise, or the risk, is the responsibility trap, which goes like this. We encounter someone in need, we begin to be moved by their story and by their plight, and as a result, we feel responsible for what happens to them, and we want to do things to help them out. And pretty soon, we can end up enmeshed in their drama, we can end up in a situation where we feel tremendous anxiety when things don't go well, and it hurts. And perhaps wisely, we avoid this kind of engagement with others because we don't want to fall into that responsibility trap. And the third problem that we end up with if we try to practice this kind of hospitality is the scandal of the particular. What does it mean to help one person out when there are so many other people in our city, in our nation, in our country who are in great need? Shouldn't we be helping all people equally? Shouldn't the effort that we make toward one be universalizable to all people? It's the burden of universality and of justice, and the scandal of particularity. Well, in response to all these problems, I want to suggest that the best thing we can do moving forward is to adopt some strategies, some strategies, not a, a comprehensive, theologically robust explanation for it all about why or how, but simply a few strategies that might help us, which is, by the way, also our Lord's approach. You notice he's always giving people little strategies to do, little, little lessons, little things that seem to make such a difference. First, I think we are perfectly right to focus on the proximal cause 
That is, those things that are close to us, those people that are close to us who we know, who we're familiar with, it's perfectly okay to start there with our generosity. Consider what Jesus says. There were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elijah, but none was healed except Naaman. <laughs> right? And by the way, saying that, Jesus is almost stoned to death. Right? People get pretty upset. The truth is, Jesus was particular. He showed up at one particular time in history, in one particular place, and he, even then, he didn't heal everybody in the entire country of Israel. He only feel, healed a few hundred people, maybe, at best. Why? Why them? Why were they so lucky? The gospel might say, so that God's glory might be revealed. Well, what on earth does that mean? I don't know. But I would say that there's something about the particular, the local, the thing that is right in front of us, that person who has come to us, that demands our attention. Second, Jesus would say that we have to empty ourselves, that we have to take the position of humility in every social situation that we find ourselves in. I think that's the meaning of the parable that he tells to the dinner guests. There's something about positioning ourselves in a humble place and being ready to, to take the lower place, the place of dishonor even. Third, and this is really interesting, there's something about grace in all of this. And this is the res resolution to the responsibility trap, by the way. That if we feel that we are responsible for the outcomes in other people's lives, then we are sorely disillusioned. There is no way that you can be responsible for what happens in another person's life. The best that you can do is help them, give them opportunities, present them with a situation in which they might flourish, but ultimately you cannot cause them to be healthier, better, happier, any of it. And if you don't think that's true, then talk to any couple that's been married for about five years, because that's usually the point at which they realize they can't change the person they're with. <laughs> All they can do is love them. All they can do is love them. It goes back to the humility thing, actually. The responsibility trap, the solution, is to have enough trust in God's grace to understand that whatever happens, it's God that did it. It's God that did it. And that we might cooperate in that grace, we might create opportunities for that grace to happen and to flourish, but ultimately it was not us that did it. It was God. Perhaps one solution toward that might be to think about all the ways in which we have been gifted by incredible generosity by the people in our lives or by the God that made us and loves us. Perhaps if we had one-tenth of an awareness of how gracious God has been to us and how every precious moment is a gift from that almighty and loving God, Perhaps then we'd feel a little bit of relief for trying to solve the world's problems. So as I said, I think the solution to this great and burdensome challenge to be generous in this kind of amazing way that God suggests in the gospel, I think the solution is not to get overwhelmed, but to adopt some specific strategies, a few little things here and there that we think might help. So now I want to open this up as I customarily do, and I want to see if anyone has any responses or anything to share about this notion of how we do Christian hospitality.